Hey, everybody, Michael Snyder, Worldwide Weather Watch. Today's March 11th. Sorry about the last technical difficulty on the previous video here, but I will do another duplicate one starting right now. Taking a look right now across the Pacific Ocean, there's the Hawaiian Islands. Look at this big area of low pressure, lots of cold air aloft. This is what's going to spawn this dynamic storm across the lower 48 states of the USA. And if you look here across the tropical region, this is what's known as the intertropical convergence zone, thunderstorm activity ongoing within there. And uh, over the planet Earth, you're getting about 2,000 thunderstorms on average at any given time. So it's kind of an interesting, fun fact there. And if we take a look there across some of the maritime continent, and there's the Indian Ocean to the left and Pacific Ocean to the right, you can again see that thunderstorm activity as we go through the day here today. So I wanted to point this out. We're looking at dynamic tropopause pressure. This kind of gives you an indication of just how thick the atmosphere is across the polar regions. It's warmer, it's more moisture, and the polar regions here, the atmosphere is much thinner and it is colder. So you can imagine the mid-latitude cyclones develop on that boundary there. And if I put that into motion, you can see that storm system swooping across the lower 48 states, for example. And you see some of that subtropical air versus that polar lobe swinging through here, very intense pressure gradient sets up as a result from that. And if we put that into motion, you can kind of see the same thing going on across some of, the, some of the Southern Hemisphere. Again, things rotate in the opposite direction down there. Now, this is another way to look at that uh, tropopause height. And this is in uh, meters here. So you can see some of the polar regions, you're looking at about half the height of the tropical regions there. And that leads me to this one. So you can kind of see that. These are exaggerated a little bit. The atmosphere is much thinner relative to planet Earth. But you can see that uh, over the equatorial regions, the tropical air mass is much deeper. Then you've got the subtropical jet stream. You've got the temperate air. And then the polar jet stream. This is usually the strongest jet stream on the planet in the northern and southern hemisphere. And then you can see the polar cell up here. And again, that layer of the atmosphere is much less deep than the tropical atmosphere, much warmer there and much more moisture across the equatorial regions. So another way to look at things here is to look at the northern hemisphere. You see the Hawaiian Islands, there's Japan, there's Africa, here's Europe right there, there's Greenland, and you can see Washington State. And if I put this into motion, again, we're looking at two meter temperatures. You can see just how chilly that air is across the northern hemisphere. And you see, it kind of looks like a heartbeat and kind of like flashing going on. That is the diurnal cycle. You can see, for example, Africa and the Sahara Desert cool down as it goes through its overnight period. Then it warms up during the daytime. And you notice the ocean does not go through that rapid heating and cooling process. That's because the oceans uh, hold much more moisture, which in turn holds much more heat there. It's much less susceptible to these diurnal and these nocturnal variations. And you can also see how kind of the daytime heating versus, you know, the cool down over the nighttime hours takes place across portions of Russia and Canada. Again, kind of looks like a heartbeat there as you're getting that diurnal cycle repeating across the Northern Hemisphere. And if you look across Antarctica, there's South America, Africa, Madagascar, Australia, and New Zealand. Look at just how cold it is at the surface there for, uh, for uh, Antarctica there. And you can kind of see where the those mid-latitude cyclones would be setting up. But yeah, kind of an interesting thing. And again, you can see the diurnal cycle across some of the rainforests there and across portions of Australia as well. So always fun to look at those views. And actually, let me back up there here a second, and I'll show you. We had a pre, we have a pretty cold current that comes, and you can imagine this air is nice and cold and dry, so it's not bringing a bunch of moisture with that. That's why the Atacama Desert is so dry. I mentioned this yesterday as well. It's one of the driest places on planet Earth, and it is between two mountain ranges as well. So it's kind of a unique setup. Only gets a couple millimeters of rain on average a year, and that's quite the contrast of what's going on across the rainforest and some of northern South America one of the most enlightening, intense regions on the planet. And again, there's the Atacama Desert there, and there's the Amazon Basin. And for today, there's a Niger, uh, 44.2 Celsius, 112 Fahrenheit for the warmest place on the planet as of March 11th. And Bostock, Antarctica, look at that, negative 76 here. So there's some world extreme temperatures for you uh, for the day yesterday, wrapping up uh, just a few hours ago there. But this is the European. I want to show this storm system again here because we're starting to get a little bit closer. We get some severe weather out in front of that. But the big nasty storm here, the major mid-latitude cyclone swooping out there, this this looks like a bowling ball rolling out across the Central Plains, across the Mississippi Valley. The storm is going to lift back up across the Great Lakes. This troughing is going to hang out for a bit as well. Got to watch for some flooding concerns, some severe weather, some blizzard conditions, and very cold temperatures on the north side of that low also. 
And again, this is mainly going to be starting here and ramping up as we go through the day Friday. There'll be severe weather portions of the east here on Saturday, Sunday, and potentially even Monday as well. Very dynamic storm system. And look at these wind gusts coming across some of the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, New Mexico. Somebody these gusts well up over 70 miles per hour. No doubt some local areas will be gusting higher. And I mean, you're talking about 70 mile per hour gusts here across some of the Texas panhandle as this mid-latitude cyclone, this very strong westerly wind will be kicking up some dust and stretching these very strong winds all the way out across Missouri, Illinois, Arkansas, and North Texas, maybe out towards Dallas and much of Oklahoma as well. Now, on the flip side of that here, you've got some severe weather with that closed low. That's This closed low spinning up this severe weather here across some of Arkansas as we go on into what is this? We're looking at Wednesday afternoon. There's Wednesday night. There's Thursday morning there. And then the big storm is right here. It really gets kicked off here as we go through Friday afternoon. There's Friday night. There's Saturday morning. There's Saturday late morning. Saturday afternoon. You can kind of see how this is hanging up here. You got to watch for that flooding concern. Slow moving storms out there. Continued rain. Rainfall training over the same areas as we go through Sunday morning starts to include some of the Florida panhandle moves up the Carolinas there hanging out on the east coast. European wants to show this stationary boundary hanging out. Really got to watch for flooding potential there. And this goes all the way on in through Monday early afternoon shown right there. Hanged, uh, this thing is hung up on Florida. And if we take a look at the precipitation in inches, 24 hour running totals. Let's scroll out here. We're going to go on into the day Friday. You see the initial round of severe weather there swooping up across from the Mississippi Valley, Illinois, up into Indiana also. And you see some of these huge amounts as we go through the day Saturday as well. These are just 24-hour running totals here. You can see some places getting four or five inches of rainfall. And there's probably going to be locally higher amounts as well. And then we get the stationary boundaries. This system races off to the north, kind of leaves a stationary boundary hung up here across portions of the Carolinas, the east coast, all the way down through Florida, all the way on in through the day Monday. Really got to watch out for that. The GFS doesn't show nearly the flooding potential with this system versus the European. So that's that's something for forecasters along the East Coast to figure out over the next couple of days as well. And now that's the same map here, the European and um, I was showing, I think, a 500 millibar wind height here. I think I took that off. But there is, at 18,000 feet, it was showing 134 knots, about 155 miles per hour with the associated jet streak there at 500 millibars. And I'll show you here in the discussion. They do talk about that in a moment. But I wanted to show you. Here's the day four outlook. You can see that includes places like Springfield, then through Memphis, Greenville, Little Rock, and includes places like Chicago, Shreveport, you're looking for the Great Lakes all the way down towards the Gulf Coast here. Day five, something similar. You're talking from Cleveland all the way back down to New Orleans on the day Saturday. And there is the day Sunday. So you got a three-day stretch through the extended forecast of, uh, forecast of severe weather. And potential flooding would be associated with that as well. And so this is 925 millibars. Let me back up to 500 millibars because I did show you that. 134 knots. So let me back up all the way to the day on Friday. So here we go. This absolute bowling ball just ripping out across the plains. Again, 134 knots, 150 mile per hour plus. That's just at 18,000 feet here. Just showing the strength of this storm. Pretty crazy looking. And then if we look at 925 millibars, kind of what's considered the low level jet, you're talking about some pretty strong moisture advection out in front of this. That's going to kick off that severe weather as well. And you're talking about 65 plus miles per hour in that uh, advection there with the low-level jet as we go through Friday night. And again, some very active weather from Friday, Friday evening, on and through Saturday here. You know, you really got to watch out and pay attention to your local authorities with this, especially if the stationary boundary hangs up for some portions of the East Coast as we go on in through the day. Sunday, you see the southerly still across portions of Florida, up the East Coast here as well, and just kind of hanging out as we go all the way on in through the day Monday as well. Good thing the GFS doesn't show that, but it's definitely something to watch in the models. The GFS total precipitation in inches as we scroll out here, you can see that it does bring the very heavy rain fall across some of Tennessee here, you know, Georgia and Alabama, there's Mississippi, but it does not show that stationary front hung up across Florida. So thumbs up for that at least, but there's still going to be some very dynamic weather no matter what occurs now. I mean, the storm system is on its way. It's all just academic at this point. It's just who is going to see the highest end impacts from the storm system.
Now, I wanted to show this as well because we talk about El Nino and La Nina almost on a daily basis here. But if we scroll through the summertime, you can kind of see we got this mixed signal here. We're in neutral conditions most likely. But then the CFS wants to cool things down a little bit as we go through the summertime. But you still have this warm water here off the coast of South America. And as we go into next fall, you can kind of see looking like a neutral pattern here across uh, the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So kind of interesting there. Doesn't look like either La Nina or El Nino at this time frame. We'll continue to watch that though things can still change and we're just kind of hanging out in La Nina territory but will it be considered an official La Nina still not quite sure about that even though we did spend a few months there and the atmosphere did look like it was in La Nina conditions at times and if we scroll down here this CFS run um, it does show, uh, you know, chilly neutral conditions as we go through the upcoming fall there. So that'll be something for us to watch. We'll see if the models start to catch on to anything there. You see some of them are showing La Nina, some of them El Nino, and a lot of them showing neutral. So we'll, we'll, we'll just continue to check that out here over the next few days. Um, and sea surface temperatures are quickly waning here. That colder water is getting ushered out across the central Pacific Ocean. And we're warming up there, even though it's fairly shallow. I mean, you don't see much upwelling here. So it looks like La Nina is on the wane here and it's probably going to be dying off here over the next month or so. Southern Oscillation Index here, the 30-day average continues to drop, but the daily contribution is still on the positive side. So the, the atmosphere still kind of has a little bit of that flavor of La Nina. The 90-day running average is about 5.11, so still up into the positive area, which we would consider kind of a La Nina signature. So when you see the positive, that means the pressure is higher here near Tahiti. Lower here for Darwin, Australia. That means you get this flow, which this neutral condition, this is similar to La Nina, but when you're in La Nina, you, you enhance this flow a little bit and you get the deeper convection out over the maritime continent. That changes ridges and troughs downstream. It has global implications as far as weather is concerned. And in the reverse for El Nino, you bring that deeper convection back out across, um, you know, some of the central Pacific Ocean there. And then you tend to have the higher pressure over Darwin, Australia, and the lower pressure here over Tahiti. So the Southern Oscillation Index is one way to tell you what kind of conditions the atmosphere thinks that we are in, otherwise known as the Pacific Walker Circulation. So anyway, hope you guys are liking this channel. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Sorry about that technical glitch with the release of that last video here, but hopefully you guys are getting the sound. Looks like the microphone is working, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow.